What do you hear when you see this? These figures at the bottom left. Is this a murmuring crowd or a group waiting quietly for something to happen? What about this black monolith? A dead, empty space or an instrument? A piano maybe? If it's a piano, what is it playing? Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Debussy or maybe even Schoenberg or Scriabin? But what do you hear when you see this colour? Anything? For the artist, for Vasily Kandinsky, this colour sounded like loud, sharp trumpets. He had what's called synesthesia, a condition where people experience the activation of one sense as the result of experiencing another. For Kandinsky, this meant that when he heard sounds, he saw colour. And when he saw colour, he heard music. And this painting, Impression 3, Concert, is his visual response to the experience of hearing a concert, a music by his contemporary and friend, the composer Arnold Schoenberg. What this painting tells us is that colour and its relationship with sound and music are very important to him, but it also shows us Kandinsky's drive to make his paintings more abstract, to make art that lacked any representation of objects or anything in nature. Kandinsky believed that the more abstract the form, the more clear and direct its appeal, and he felt that music was the pinnacle of abstraction. He wrote the following, Music has been the art which has devoted itself not to the reproduction of natural phenomena, but rather to the expression of the artist's soul. You can listen to Debussy's La Mer, for example, in the knowledge that it's an impressionistic depiction of the sea, waves, storm and wind. But you can also listen without knowing anything about the composition, and it can still have a profound effect. Music is inherently abstract, and this is what Kandinsky was aiming for in art. He wanted his paintings to be an expression of an inner need, an expression of his soul. Kandinsky was born in Moscow in 1866, and he began his career studying and eventually teaching law and economics. It was only through two formative experiences that he would eventually abandon his teaching career to become an artist. One was an exhibition of Monet's work in Moscow in 1896, where he saw one of his haystacks. He was struck by the thought that it was the colour and form that was triggering his emotional response, and not the objects, the haystacks, themselves. And the second experience was a performance of Wagner's opera Lohengrin at the Bolshoi Theatre also in 1896. He spoke about the experience later on. I saw all my colours in spirit before my eyes. Wild, almost crazy lines were sketched in front of me. A pretty amazing statement when you think that he painted this later in his life. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The challenge in 1896 for Kandinsky was how to both develop the abstraction that he saw in Monet's haystacks, but also how to match, in art, the freedom of expression he felt music had already achieved. Over the next few years, he moved to Munich to study, travelled extensively, was exposed to symbolism, neo-impressionism, fauvism and cubism, read and absorbed the principles of theosophy and began experimenting with colour and form. You can see his moves towards abstraction appearing very early on. In 1903 he paints this, their Blauer Reiter, the Blue Rider. It's clearly representational, but colour is becoming more important. The rider is made up of a series of colours, and the objects themselves seem like a secondary consideration. Blue was clearly an important colour for Kandinsky. In 1909 he finishes this canvas, the Blue Mountain. There's clear influence of fauvism here, flat planes and blocks of colour where each colour is treated as equally important. Kandinsky was obsessed with experimentation and drawn into increasingly progressive surroundings. In 1911 he formed Der Blauer Reiter, a new artists collective named after his 1903 canvas that was designed to bring together the best artistic talent in Munich. This was a group that didn't conform to a single style and through publishing an almanac in 1912, they showed that they wanted to embrace all forms of art, as well as music, with contributions from composers like Schoenberg, Verburn and Berg. It was during this period that Kandinsky not only began to radically shift his approach to painting, but also to distill his ideas in written form. In 1912, he published one of the most influential essays on painting, concerning the spiritual in art. Here he laid down his ideas on the dematerialization of art but alongside this, he also gave significant insights into how he thought about colour. For Kandinsky, every colour had a feeling, a sensation and a sound. Green is the most restful colour that exists. In music, the absolute green is represented by the placid middle notes of a violin. 
White has the harmony of silence, which works upon us negatively, like many pauses in music that break the melody. A total dead silence has the inner harmony of black. In music, it is represented by one of those profound and final pauses, after which any continuation of the melody seems the dawn of another world. Black is the colour of least harmony at all. Light warm red is the sound of trumpets, strong, harsh and ringing. Cool red, madder, is the sad middle tones of a cello. Orange's note is that of an angelus or of an old violin. Violet is an English horn or the deep notes of a wood instrument such as the bassoon. And blue, blue is the heavenly colour. A light blue is like a flute, a darker blue a cello. Darker is a thunderous double bass. And the darkest blue of all, an organ. Kandinsky wanted to find a means of communication that was universal through perception of colour. Colour is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand which plays, touching one key or another to cause vibrations in the soul. But colour can't stand alone. If you try and imagine something red, you can experience a never-ending colour in your mind. But as soon as you try and represent it on a material, it's limited by the canvas, or screen, that you're seeing it on. This is the form. It can be abstract or representational, but it always has a boundary. And it's the way different forms are combined in a painting that determines the overall composition. Simple compositions, according to Kandinsky, are paintings that are constructed in a clear and obvious way. Kandinsky called these melodic. Think of Cezanne's Bathers, which is constructed around triangles. According to Kandinsky, each of these geometric forms has its own intrinsic melody, and the way they cause your eyes to move across the canvas creates an internal rhythm in the painting. So when multiple, more complex forms are combined, you create a much more intricate composition. Kandinsky called these symphonic. And perhaps the best examples of these are Kandinsky's own groundbreaking works that he dedicated 19 years of his life to. 10 paintings, entitled, appropriately, Composition 1 to 10. Kandinsky viewed his compositions as the most important works in his output, and in making these paintings, he set out to achieve his most important goal, to reach the level of abstraction that he experienced when he heard music. This is Kandinsky setting colour in motion, using overlapping forms, rhythms and motifs to create pure art, which on first viewing seems completely lacking in any form of representation. Nothing in our natural world seems to be present here. But if you look closer, these paintings are actually full of objects, like the reclining figures in Composition 4, the boat with figures and oars in Composition 5, or the angel holding a yellow trumpet at the top of the canvas in Composition 7. Composition 7 is a particularly interesting example of a symphonic work. Multiple motifs overlap simultaneously to create a mass of colour that's incredibly rhythmically complex. Your eyes dart across the canvas. This feels like a perfect artistic representation of the dissonant free chromatic music written by Schoenberg and his contemporaries at the same time Composition 7 was painted. But it could be argued that Kandinsky's next work in the series, Composition 8, was the closest he ever got to music in art. It's constructed around a number of geometric forms, circles, semicircles, open-ended acute angles, squares and rectangles, some coloured, some taking on the off-white colour of the background. Colours on this canvas combine like musical chords, consonant and dissonant harmonies are heard simultaneously, one followed by another without resolution. On top of this, Lines and shapes create forms and melodies that run and bleed into each other, creating long, drawn-out motifs. Viewing Composition 8 is like listening to a piece of music in the blink of an eye, with the harmonies and rhythms all being played at the same time. And so the arts are encroaching, one upon another, and from this will rise the art that is truly monumental. Every man who steeps himself in the spiritual possibilities of his art is a valuable helper in the building of the spiritual pyramid which will someday reach to heaven. So the next time you're looking at a painting, just ask yourself, what does this sound like? Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this essay, and if you did, please do consider subscribing to my channel. 
I've got lots of videos already up there and lots planned as well, including some more about music and art. So do let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see more of this type of content. See you next time.